this week is uh, Remembrance Week, with uh, November 11th being um, a day when Canadian society, we, uh, we take time to honor those who fought to protect the freedoms that we enjoy, freedom from the darkness of tyranny that could have been had they not made the sacrifices they made. So during this time, we thank God for the victory that he granted us. But uh, albeit at a great price for peace, um, I believe that God wants us to, to focus on something a little bit different this morning. So it is Remembrance Week, and I don't mean to show any kind of disrespect for the fallen soldiers who paved the way for our freedom. But I, I believe the Lord wants us to look at another uh, aspect of freedom this morning and remember that. Um, we're thankful for the freedom in our country, but I'd like to focus on the one that paved the way for us to receive spiritual and everlasting freedom. I think it's appropriate for Remembrance Day to speak about the remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen? Amen. Now, as most of you are aware, we've started a series in the book of Mark where we've been focusing in on the life and the ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we're going to continue that journey today. In the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 to 43, that's going to be my text for this morning's message that I've entitled, Remembering Who Controls the Outcomes. One of the unsettling things that we see when uh, we start into the book of Mark is that Simon and Peter had to leave their nets on the shore and follow Christ, but in this first part of Mark, we see that there was a, an issue in Peter's household. See, it's unsettling. Peter had to leave his nets and follow Christ. And it, it's written in here that his mother-in-law was sick at Peter's home, laying in bed with a fever. Now, we read about this circumstance starting with verse 29. And, and the reason I say it's unsettling, can you imagine being called to leave everything, to leave your, your, uh, your occupation, to follow Christ, but yet have this nagging sensation on the inside of you that all was not well at home and that your wife had to look after her mother, and her mother who was desperately ill at the time. That would be unsettling. And that's why I say it was unsettling. It was a wonderful thing to be called. And last, last week we talked about how Jesus called them to be fishers of men, and they willingly dropped everything, and they went, and they followed Jesus. But here we find in verse 29, as we continue in our reading, as soon as they left the synagogue, and this is the synagogue in Capernaum, Capernaum they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her by the hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Wow. Well, just think about this for a minute. Okay? One of the things that was hard for the disciples, the first disciples, Peter and Andrew, was the sick mother-in-law. And Jesus saw through into their hearts and knew the struggle that they were having in, in having to follow him. Because this was deep on their heart. If you've ever had a sick parent, you'll understand this, right? How difficult it is if you have to work and you have to keep your, your, your commitments and everything, and, and yet you have a sick parent maybe in a different town than where you'd be working. Picture that in your heart. That's what was, was going on here. And it shows us about the character and nature of God and the compassion that he has over the circumstances. You see, they, they went to this household. After the, the miraculous things that happened 
at the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, you remember we talked about a demon-possessed uh, person being set free uh, last week. We talked about that. Um, this was on the Sabbath day. So they went specifically over to the, the house of Peter and Andrew to, to, to minister to Peter's mother-in-law. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that strikes me. Now, in, in, in Israel at that time, they didn't go anywhere on the Sabbath, particularly not knowing that they would have to do any kind of work or anything like that. But the heart of Christ was compassionate over this woman more than the letter of the, the religious law of the day. Jesus had a compassion in him that compelled him, and we see this many, many times in Scripture, where Jesus ministered and, and healed people on the Sabbath day. That's because um, the Sabbath was was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And Jesus had this right, and he had this principle, and as God in the flesh, um, he had compassion. And he wants us to have compassion on people in the same manner. Now, Simon was a, to be a fisher of men, and, and one of the things that would be distracting for him in the mission that God called him to would be thinking about his poor wife at home and how she had to struggle with her mother, in, with her mother, his mother-in-law, while he was gone. And Jesus saw this, and not only was it a work of compassion for the mother-in-law to be healed, but it was also compassion for Peter, who would be serving the Lord in the capacity that he was called to, and Andrew as well. But Jesus saw this poor woman, and she, as she lay on her bed of affliction, and uh, you, you can imagine... Um, in, in that culture, too, when, when people came over to your house, right, in that particular culture, it was the women's uh, role to make people feel welcome and to kind of, you know, prepare the food and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and Peter's mother-in-law would have loved to participate with this, but she wasn't able to either. So here we see Jesus coming, and... Uh, he took her, simply took her by the hand and helped her up. You see, there's power resident in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he didn't have to shout or do anything. Uh, he just took her by the hand, helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. <laughs> the, the, the fever completely went away. Completely went away. Now, she was completely healed from the sickness. And I believe so much so uh, was, the, was the gratitude latent within her that she, she needed to, to show her gratitude by serving Christ and by serving the ministry that he represented. You know, this tells us something. When God absolutely touches you and heals you, if it's a physical affliction, if it's a, a psychological affliction, a spiritual affliction. He touches you and he heals you. You know what happens? There's a gratitude in, in your heart that, that rises forth so that, that you want to serve him. That's, you see, when God touches us, he touches us so that we can, can, can join with him in his kingdom work. Now, there's a big lesson in this as well is Regardless of the circumstances, God is in control of the outcomes of things. So it doesn't matter how dire the circumstance seems or how difficult it is. God controls the outcomes. If God wants to do something in and through you in a ministry capacity of any kind, he is going to equip you with the ability to carry that out as well as the circumstances to surround you that will make that possible. And I would venture to say that if God closes the door on something, he will make it so that you will not be able to carry out that task. That you will be stopped from going where you figure that you should be going or that you might think that he wants you to go. You know, you hear that saying, 
when God closes a door, he opens a window. Because sometimes the door that we think we need to walk through isn't the door that Jesus wants us to walk through. He opens a window instead and lets us, you know, continue our journey through there. Well, God is in control of all of the outcomes of our, our lives. When, when he calls us to serve him, he provides us and equips us with everything we need to walk and to complete that mission in a way that's honoring to him. And he also wants us to remember that the mission that he calls us to isn't our mission. It's his mission. He calls us to participate with him in his mission. Peter and Andrew were called to participate with Jesus in his mission. Peter's mother-in-law, in a different circumstance, was called to participate with Jesus in her mission. And God made it possible for that to happen supernaturally. God's the same today, people. You don't have to worry and fret about things that you can't control. God is in control of the outcomes. Amen? He is. This is something that we can be filled with thanksgiving for. Because we don't have to carry our burdens alone. Jesus walks with us, and he helps us through it. And if there's something that needs to be done, he will pave the way for that to take place. So we can rest in him. And the rest of God can be uh, a peace that surpasses understanding, that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Therefore, don't be anxious about anything that you find yourself in. You've, are you sick physically? Don't be anxious. God is with you. And his, his path for you will, will be exactly how he is designed. Yes, pray to him. Ask him all kinds of prayers and requests. And he'll meet you exactly where you need to be. Sometimes God says no, you know. Sometimes he says, no, you know. Sometimes he says, wait, it's not the right timing. And sometimes he says, yes. And in this particular case, it was, yes, it's my will that Peter's mother-in-law is healed so that she can serve me and so that Peter and Andrew can serve me as well. That was his will. Now, that evening, it says in verse 32, continuing, after sunset... The people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Well, as the Jews desired to honor the Sabbath laws, as soon as the Sabbath day was over, because they were on the Sabbath, remember? So Jesus healed his mother, Peter's mother-in-law on the Sabbath. As soon as the Sabbath was over, as the sun went down that evening, what does it say here? The whole town of Capernaum, Capernaum gathered at the door, and we are told that that evening, many people were healed and delivered from demonic possession. Wow. Okay. So you can imagine. Jesus had just been in the synagogue that day. And that demoniac guy starts ranting and raving. And Jesus casts the demon out of this guy. He's set free. Then he goes to Peter's house. And the mother-in-law is healed of her fever just by simply Jesus reaching out his hand and helping her up, standing up, boom, gone, fever done. The, the word is getting out about Jesus in the town of Capernaum. Now, there's some excitement building here. And Jesus came to seek and save those who are lost, and his ministry was launching forward into uh, Galilee, and it was going to extend into Jerusalem, and this is a launching point. And, and you can see that Jesus, um, when he started to do these things, you know that there's going to be attention drawn to this ministry. This, they, people have never seen anything like this before. They've never seen anything like this before. So as soon as the Sabbath was over, they heard this Jesus Christ, well, they didn't call him Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth at the time. That's what they called him. This Jesus of Nazareth, is laying hands upon the sick, and the sick are recovering from their physical diseases. And people that are afflicted by demons 
and tormented by demons are being set free. Now Jesus, he sees these people and I believe he looks upon them all with compassion. He looks on them with compassion. And I think there's different scriptures that talk about this. The Lord Jesus put everyone's needs before his own. And, you know, in a broken world, there are so many needs out there. Just think about the needs that surround you and your family. The things that maybe you've experienced or that others around you that are close to you experience. The afflictions that are out there. There's needs. And in the time that Jesus was ministering in Capernaum, there, there was many, 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 many needs and many concerns. You see, the people were looking to God for deliverance from their oppression, for one. There was oppression and suffering from the Roman tyranny which had set its grip on the region, and, and it was a significant suffering. There, there was economic despair due to the heavy taxation upon them. There, there was also physical despair. Now, today when people are sick, I mean, when you get sick today, there's medications that are developed that ease the suffering, right? So if you get a bad fever, I mean, you can take a Tylenol and, and your fever dissipates, right? There's different medications that have been developed over the years that ease people's sufferings. But in ancient times, things like Tylenol and antibiotics and other kinds of medicine that we have today were not in existence. So... When people were afflicted by sickness, they suffered greatly. I mean, they had a basic medicine. You can see history books tell us about different Roman medicines and, and medicines in, in Israel and that sort of thing. But people suffered very greatly. Um, for instance, we're going to be talking next week about a leper that was healed. We're not going to talk about that this week, but leprosy was a, was a, was a common ailment in those days, and there was no known cure for it at all. I mean, we've developed a cure for it now where you can be treated by a certain antibiotic and it makes leprosy disappear. So that's great. But in those days, they were afflicted. And word got out amongst the people that Jesus was healing people of their diseases. So they came to him in droves. The whole town came out. Like um, Capernaum was a fishing town. And this is the home of these fishermen disciples, right? So you can imagine all these guys in this smaller town, they probably would have known most of the people in the community. All of these people that they knew growing up were coming to, to see Jesus heal and to see Jesus deal with the infirmity of demonic possession. And, and that, was, that was something else for these disciples, right? So I want to talk about demonic possession for a little bit bit here, okay? A lot of people uh, have confusion about demonic possession. Um, and, uh, you know, throughout the ages, there has been a lot of confusion about this as well because, y you know, there's, there's different ailments that can, can affect a person's uh, mental well-being and, and psychological well-being. And not all of them are caused by demons. You know, a lot, there's a, a lot of mental illness that's caused by a physical problem or, or maybe a psychological problem. And, and, and there's possible, a possibility with the psychological problem that it's influenced by demons, but not necessarily a demon possession. But there is definitely a difference between spiritual illness, which is demonically driven by illness that is either physical or psychological. Um, one of the things that uh, you see when someone's suffering uh, physical or psychological illness, they, they can have seizures. It can affect their ability to communicate effectively. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the demonic influence. Some people get confused about all this. As soon as someone ha displays an illness like epilepsy or something, they think that's demonic possession. Or it, it's not. There's various reasons why things happen, you know, in, in the mind. A and illness is, is caused by different things. It can be caused by a psychological break of some sort or, uh, or a disease, you know, that causes a person not to be able to communicate well or there, there's so many different things, but 
Nevertheless, spiritual possession by a demon is a very real condition, and it is around us today, and we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be uh, surprised at seeing the work of demonic entities in people's lives, right? We live in a world where the God of this world has, uh, has, has done many things uh, bad to people. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's out there trying to destroy. A person with a demon will generally have one or more of the following characteristics. Firstly, a person may have been involved in occult activities where they opened up themselves to spiritual darkness by participating in the occult. Oftentimes, a person that's demon-possessed has opened themselves up and has taken down the guards and has welcomed darkness into their spirit. And the, the darkness, when that happens, will take advantage of that circumstance and come in and take over. A person um, may claim that has demon possession, may claim to have demonic visions or hear demonic voices telling them to do terrible things. The person who's demonically possessed, may have seizures coupled with displays of bizarre or fierce or violent behavior towards themselves or others, cutting themselves or, or attacking other people. This is commonplace with demonic possession. Uh, the person may also manifest a change in their voice and a change in their personality accompanied by supernatural knowledge of things that would be impossible for them in the natural to know. Now, I've dealt with this before. And it's not very nice. It's not very pretty to see a, a demonically possessed person being destroyed inside by, by the devil. It's, it's terrible. Um, a person may also display supernatural strength or be able to do supernatural things such as levitating objects or levitating themselves even. And, and there is cases out there that are documented where all this has happened. So, you know, the psychological community, uh, no, you know, there's some that say, oh, it's just a, 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 mis, a misrepresented uh, mental illness. That there, it's a religious thing spin off of that, right? But when you, you deal with it enough, you realize, no, there's a spiritual dimension here and the God of this world is, is very real and he's very active in trying to destroy people. And in my years as a pastor and a police officer, I mean, I'm not going to tell you stories about this because it's, there's no point in it, okay? But suffice, suffice to say, I, I have encountered some very, very bizarre behaviors dis displayed by different people that are beyond natural, and I know without a shadow of doubt that are, they're caused by evil spirits being possessed into a person. And, you know, like, I don't want to belittle the fact that there's mental illness, right? I've also uh, probably taken hundreds of people into the hospital under the Mental Health Act, where a person was suffering, suffering from a, an extreme psychological break down and uh, or you know they they have they're displaying symptoms where they're going to hurt themselves or another person now i'm not saying that those things can't be influenced by a demon a lot of times people will want to commit suicide and stuff like that and that's a result of demonic whispers but they're not possessed they're just there's whispers going on in their ears there's oppression there's demonic oppression which can really affect a mental uh mental illness but there's possession where the person is completely uh, possessed by, by evil. Now, one thing about this I can say is that demonic claws get into people today just as they did in the time of Jesus. And what did these people need? What did they need? They needed deliverance. They needed deliverance. And they needed salvation. And Jesus loved them, and he cared for them, and he took the time to minister to the need that was present. People need deliverance today through Jesus, just as when he walked among us in the same way. But there's no power on earth 
that can rout demons from possessing a person except for the power of God that is latent within the Lord Jesus Christ and his name through the power of his shed blood on the cross. That is the only thing that can remedy someone from a demonic entity. See, Jesus Christ, fully man while he walked on the earth, but also fully God. He walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Colossians 1.19 says this, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. Colossians 1.19, and talking about Jesus. There's another scripture in Philippians 2, 8, and 11, 8 to 11, which points us to the authority that is present in Jesus' name. It's written, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. There's no power on earth that can compare with the power of our God. And he has authority over the principalities and powers of darkness in this realm. When Jesus walked among us, he displayed the power of God working through him in cleansing the body, mind, and spirit of the entire being of the person. And the people of Capernaum recognized his authority over both the natural order and the supernatural order of things. And that's why they were flocking there. The entire town gathered. In the sea of humanity, where needs are prevalent, you see, God has called us to be his ambassadors. You see, God speaks through his people, through the disciples. And it's good for us to remember the authority that Jesus has because the authority that Jesus has over the natural and the supernatural realm, okay, he's called us to step forward in his name and under his authority. There's no authority in you by yourself or me by myself. No authority at all. But when we go out into the world of darkness that is around us, we step forward with the authority of Jesus Christ because he is Lord. And he's given his disciples authority in Jesus' name. Now, exemplifying this authority when Jesus was ministering at one point, he sent out 72 of his disciples to minister in his name and with the authority that he brought. And when they came back to him, they told him how things went on the ministry journey that he sent them out on. They told Jesus this, and it's actually written in Luke, chapter 10, 17 to 20. The 72 returned with joy and said, what'd they say? Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And the point of the matter is, through our text in the book of Mark, we see how Jesus was displaying the authority of God in the circumstances on the final outcome of how illness plays out in people, regardless of whether it's mental, physical, or spiritual. And that his purpose in all this is not just to throw his authority around like a magic trick, but God displays healing power in order to point people towards salvation, which can only be found in him, and it's the same today. There's lots of people out there that, like Simon the Sorcerer, they want special powers so that they can be the powerful one, so that they can build up their own egos and all. Nothing to do with that. True spiritual 
authority comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone to the glory of God for the salvation of souls that are lost, that are otherwise going to hell. And Jesus is reaching out to them and he's reaching out to them through us as well. Acts 4, 12 tells us this. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And it's important for us to be thankful to God. Not that we carry the authority to command spirits to come out of people. But we need to be thankful and rejoice that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life because of the grace of God that's been given to us. Amen? It's nothing that, nothing that happens in our lives is outside of the spectrum of God's control. Nothing. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you are not your own. You're purchased with a price. The precious blood of Jesus has purchased you. You belong to him. That means whether you are uh, in a troubling circumstance, whether you're in sickness, or in health, whether you're in a difficult struggle or on the mountaintop of some kind of victory in your life, you don't belong to your, yourself. You belong to Christ. And everything that Christ works in and through you is for his glory. You know that? So be thankful. Remember what Jesus has done. Remember that Jesus Christ is Lord over all. He's Lord over the darkness. He's Lord over everything that can uh, raise up against the knowledge of God. He's, he's Lord over that. And we don't have to cower in fear of that kind of stuff. Because it's not, it's not, it's not going to hurt us. Unless God allows something to hurt us, nothing's going to hurt us. It doesn't mean to say your life is going to be like, I've said before, a cloud dance. It's not going to be like that. All the apostles except for one were were betrayed into the hands of sinners and, and, and were martyred for their faith. They were executed and their blood was spilt. Just like the master of Christ, Jesus, blood was spilt. John, the surviving one, was dipped in boiling oil, apparently. That's, he lived out his life, but he was marred by, you know, these guys were, were, were persecuted. Now, does that mean that we're going to have that happen to us? I don't know what the future holds. We don't know that, okay? But all I know is his grace is sufficient for us. His strength is perfect, perfected in our weakness, and he'll give us the strength to overcome whatever circumstance we have. Whatever. No matter if it leads to our death, he'll give us the strength by his grace to overcome. So, just, just because... Um, a person gets martyred doesn't mean the devil has gained a victory. See, we need to understand this stuff. Just because someone gets hurt in the line of ministry doesn't mean that the devil's gaining a victory. I want to repeat that again. Just because you get hurt in the line of duty as a follower of Jesus Christ does not mean the devil is getting a victory. It does not mean that. Jesus is Lord over the circumstances and he uses sometimes our suffering to advance his eternal purposes because he looks, he looks beyond the physical and the time that we have like about that long in the line of eternity which goes on forever. He uses that for his glory. And if my suffering advances his kingdom and that others would come to know Christ, that's more important than my physical health or well-being in the present. Because guess what? In the blink of an eye, in the blink of an eye, we're going to be changed. All the suffering of this age and the little things that we have to give, you know, that we have to give as a sacrifice are nothing compared to the glory that awaits us. This is very light and momentary suffering, no matter how bad it is. It's light and momentary. God has an eternal plan for you, my friend. 
eternal plan for me, an eternal plan for us together as a church. And nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, absolutely nothing. But we misunderstand sometimes um, that that doesn't mean we're going to have it easy all the time. North America, man, we've had it easy, easy street. The last little while, it's been a little tougher. But nothing compared to what these guys faced in the early church. Nothing compared to what our brothers and sisters in Christ experienced behind uh, the, 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 the communist regimes. Can you imagine being a Christian in North Korea? That's suffering. That's real suffering. Yet the Christians die rejoicing in Christ. There's testimonies of it. They're tortured for Christ, and they're rejoicing. Why? Because it feels good in the physical? No, because they know the ultimate destiny that they are going to, and it is not of this world. <laughs> okay. Now, in this verse, we also see that demons know who Jesus is, and they know about his power. It is therefore possible, I think, if we look at this, if you analyze this, it is possible for a being to have all of the theological knowledge in the world and to have knowledge of the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ, but also be against his purposes and be lost. God, God's created beings may have an absolute understanding of the truth, but just because of the fact that they have the intellectual assent and they know what the truth is does not mean that their heart is aligned with God's kingdom. In the kingdom of God, Jesus' kingdom is one of both truth and power. The truth was recognized by the demons, and Jesus wouldn't let them speak. They recognized the truth, that he was the son of God, that he had come to be the salvation for mankind. They understood that. But they were lost because there was no changed heart. There was no repentance. There was no saving faith. And this is worthy of consideration. This is why it's written that on judgment day, many people will be lost, thinking that they are saved because they have a knowledge of the truth, because they understand that Jesus Christ is the Savior, because they believe that he is the Savior. But this, the belief that they have it, that Jesus is a Savior is not accompanied by a repentant heart by a heart that submits to the authority of God. And this is why you will see Jesus warning people saying in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. It's important for people to get this right. Believing in Jesus is not enough. Believing mentally ascending that he is the Savior is not enough. Okay, That's not saving faith. When it says, believe in the name of Jesus and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, it's talking not just about believing that he is the Savior, but it is talking about when a saving faith, that belief is accompanied by repentance and submission to his authority. Demons believed in Jesus. They were even willing to confess with their mouths that he was Lord. But, and, but many people are the same way. Oh yeah, I believe that Jesus is, God, is Christ. And then they go about living their lives as if he didn't even exist. That his word doesn't even apply. They may believe well enough that he is the savior, but it's not accompanied by repentance. It's demonic faith. Saving faith is believing and submitting. After Jesus finished his ministry at Simon Peter's house, we see that he was tired I'm going to move on past that point now. He was tired. If you were dealing with people that had demons and you're struggling through that, it's very tiring. There's a lot of emotion involved in this. 
Jesus, by the way, wouldn't let those demons speak because he didn't want them to be the ones that told or people about him, I believe. He wanted people to see in other ways. So he silenced them. But when he was done, he was tired. The Son of God, although fully God, we see that he humbled himself and was incarnated as fully man. And as such, the glory of the eternal creator veiled himself in flesh to be a man just like us, subject to the weaknesses of getting our flesh tired, right? Our, the weakness of our, of our flesh becoming tired. After Jesus poured out himself in assisting others, being also that he had been had chosen to be a man, he had been incarnated as a man, his flesh became weary. And after ministering to others, Jesus retreated from Simon Peter's home, it says, to a solitary place where he had alone time and time in prayer. In Mark 1, um, chapter 35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Despite the great needs that were present, the disciples um, were excited Jesus was doing all these miracles in their town with all these people that they grew up with. Come on, Lord, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's, 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 let's enjoy this and bask in this and have something happen in here, man. Let, we can have a permanent synagogue in, a, a synagogue of healing in, in Capernaum. Come on, Jesus. They called him, and they, they meant well. But Jesus had a, had a mission for everybody not just for one little place. He had a ministry that he wanted to spread everywhere. And, and, and part of that meant, first of all, that he needed to rest up, and then he needed to get back on track with the mission that God had for him to complete. And resting up meant him being refreshed in commune with the Father in prayer. We can learn so much from this, people. We were never meant to work seven days a week. There's a Sabbath rest for God's people, and we need to enter that rest. Yes, in a spiritual sense, we do. But also, we need to rest from our labor um, during the week, too, because if we don't, we're going to get burned out. God knows this. The Sabbath was made for man because he knew that it was right. So when we are doing our work, we need to take time to rest and reflect and to pray and to ask the Lord to reveal himself to us in a deeper way. That reflection time, that alone time, is so important. Don't forget this principle. But equally, don't forget this, that Jesus, okay, in his ministry, had a greater purpose than just having a great revival meeting in one little place. And this is where the church has gone wrong sometimes. God does something really great, so we gather around and we go, let's bask in this. Let's, let's kind of bottle this. We'll bottle this and make it last. And uh, maybe we can drink from it week after week, year after year, and we can just sort of have this thing. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this, the purpose of revival in our hearts is to prepare us so that we can be effective in reaching outside of the walls of the church to the people that need Jesus because they're lost. That's the mission of Christ. So when revival meetings happen, it's not just about stirring the, 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 the people so that they're fired up for the sake of being fired up, for the sake of how they can feel. I feel a little sparkly and clean. Well, that's great. Well, what does it make you do? God's purpose is when, you make, when he makes you feel sparkly and clean and renewed and strengthened is to prepare you for the next leg of the journey to get out there and get your hands dirty and picking up the people that are dying on the road of life, as the Good Samaritan says. The Good Samaritan's parable says. That's what it is. That's what God's purpose is for us, my friends. When God blesses us and revives us and stirs us and fills us with his Holy Spirit, it's not meant as a personal basking time to bring heaven somehow here to earth so we can bottle it and, and contain it. No, it's, it's meant to prepare us to go out effectively and to reach into a world of darkness. Why? Because Jesus loves the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. 
that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The Son of God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is our mandate. As disciples, we are followers of Jesus. And likewise, when it's time for us to retreat and have a little rest, that's great, but it's time to get busy and get our hands dirty again after that. There's no retirement program in the kingdom of God. We don't retire here. We, we retire in the presence of Jesus when he takes us home. So while we have breath in us, we live to glorify God. Yes, our tran we transition into different ministries as our time goes on. Like, you know, when I'm 95 years old, I'm probably not going to be preaching up here. If God grants me the, the time, I, I'm probably not going to be preaching if, if, I, if, if God grants me 95 years. But I pray that I will be a prayer warrior and behind the scenes supporting the work of Christ in any way that I can. That's the way God wants us to view it. Everything that we do, every everything that we enjoy is given to us to, to strengthen us to do his good work. Okay. Verse 36. Simon and his companions went out to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, this is just reinforcing what I said here, because this is, this is the heart of Christ. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That's why I have come. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. That was, that's what Jesus did. Christians, Christ-like ones, were to be imitators of, of Jesus as his dearly loved children. God's calling us today to have the same heart that he has for those people out there that don't know him. He's calling us to participate with him in his good work and, and, and to, to let our light shine before men that they say, may see our good works and glorify the Father who's in heaven. So today, I'm just asking. Let's look at this example of Jesus. Let's remember what he's done and why he's done it. He wants to build his kingdom, and he wants you and me to participate in it. So, why do we come to church? It's not just to edify and build up myself for the sake of edifying and building up myself because it makes my life better. That's not it. If we're coming for that reason, we've got it wrong. It's edifying and building us up to prepare us for where we're going. If I'm a plumber, I need to be a plumber for Jesus. If I'm a housewife, I need to be a housewife for Jesus. If I'm an elderly person and retired, I need to be an elderly person that's retired for Jesus. If I am a pastor, I need to be a pastor for Jesus. Whatever you are, no matter what your circumstance is, if I'm a kid, I'm a kid for Jesus. Going to school for Jesus. Everything is about the Lord and his mission. So today, let's look at Jesus. Let's be thankful for for what he's done for us, and remember that he has set the example for us to follow. That demons, they subject, they have to be subjected to the name of Jesus. When we stand on the name of Jesus, those demons are subject to Jesus. There's nothing in heaven and earth that can separate us from the love of God. We don't have to fear the demons. We fear the Lord. And the Lord will overcome the demons as we walk forward in his name. Are you going to encounter the darkness? Yes, you are. You're going to, as a, as a, as a Christ-like one, you will encounter the darkness because it's all around us. Don't be surprised when you do, but know that there's authority in Jesus' name that he's given to you to trample on sc scorpions and snakes in his name. Not for your own sake, but for the sake of the kingdom of God. Amen?